I have a question. How can, how can Christians, a people of God, His own possession, uh, a royal priesthood we saw last, last week, declare His praises before others uh, in keeping with the mandate there in uh, verse 9, de- extolling His excellencies? How do we do that? Well, we find the answer uh, to that question in the section at hand, and it's going to be from 2.11 all the way through 3, chapter 3 and verse 12. And this is the second cycle of practical exhortation in in this epistle. And in this section, Peter answers uh, this question, that question I just asked, by pointing out specific ways, and, and, uh, and they are specific ways Christians should behave differently from the Word, which ultimately uh, declares the excellencies of God, how we live our lives. This piece uh, showed up in the National Public Radio uh, Mornings Edition in in November, and uh, it it read, In 1958, uh, American, uh, excuse me, America's first commercial Jet Air Service, that was in, in, eight, in, like I said, 1988. The first commercial Jet Air Service began with a flight of the Boeing 707. Uh, a month after that first flight, there was a traveler uh, on a piston engine airplane, propeller-driven DC-6, and he struck up a conversation with another passenger who was seated by him on that plane. And the passenger happened to be a Boeing engineer. He worked for Boeing. And the traveler asked that engineer about this new jet aircraft that was was out. Whereupon the engineer, he began to speak uh, at length about the the extensive uh, testings that had gone on by Boeing that were done with this uh, jet engine before bringing it into commercial service. And he recounted to this other, this man who had asked, uh, Boeing's experiences with engines from the B-17 uh, all the way to the B-52. And then ultimately, his traveling companion asked him if he himself had flown, yet flown on this uh, 707 jet airliner. And the engineer replied, I think I'll wait until it's been in service a while. Now, the point I make is this, by bridging it over, is even enthusiastic talking about our faith doesn't mean much if we aren't also willing to put our lives where our mouth is. If we're not going to live it, all the talk in the world, it just doesn't have the impact. It's not going to have it. It's not enough to tell people how great our God is. We need to show them He is great by our behavior, by how our lives are changed. And that so, even in the midst, even in the midst of a hostile environment, even more so, it it extols the greatness of our God. If we can shine and live in such a way for Him in the midst of an environment that's hostile toward God, It declares His greatness. We've embraced it, and our lives show that. This is what convinces people ultimately, is your life, my life. Uh, The believer's life. Not necessarily our words. God can take the words. I understand that. The Word is living and active. We share the Gospel. It's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We're told in Isaiah that it will accomplish that for which God sends it forth. It will not come back to Him void. I understand those dynamics. But if you really want to extol the excellencies of God, it's by embracing what we have in God as believers and living in light of it. A life. And today we look at a general, a general exhortation to appropriate, excuse me, uh, appropriate uh, individual conduct. To, to appropriate the truths of being saved and have a life that speaks of it. And that's what we're looking at. Look at verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2. 
Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Powerful passage. And what we learn here is, is this. As God's people, you and I as believers, we are to so live uh, that our lives, our very lives, serve to silence the godless and to glorify God. Let me restate it again. As God's people, we are to so live that our lives serve to silence the godless and to glorify God. Now, how do we do this? How do we do this? I mean, how do we make that so? Well, it starts by heeding Peter's appeal in these, these two verses we just looked at uh, here. It, 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 this appeal, it's an appeal regarding our conduct before the world. That's what he appeals to us on. And there are two aspects. There are two aspects of the appeal or uh, of this appeal uh, to notice if we are to shut the mouths or silence the godless, and glorify God in our conduct. So with that, I want to go ahead and we want to move on here into the text itself and uh, look at this first aspect, if you will, of Peter's appeal that we need to note if we are to achieve the goal of, of, of what he's calling us to here. The first aspect is this. There is an inner discipline called for. There is an inner discipline called for. Look at verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. We must abstain, we're told here, we must abstain from fleshly lust. That's what he tells us. He opens this, this second cycle of practical exhortation. And I want you to see this not in an authoritative tone. He's not throwing out a command here. This, he's, not, he's not doing this in, in an authoritative way, but as one who loved and cared for his readers. And how do I know that? He says beloved here. He calls them beloved. And, and, and it's the uh, agape toy uh, is the word that's used here. Agape, that love there, that affection, that, that, that godly uh, feeling, more than an emotion, but a, 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 an affection of the soul for his brothers, the beloved. Peter loved these people. He loved them. And his love was of the caliber, and I want you to understand this, it was of, an, of a caliber that seeks the best for the people of God. That's biblical love. Understand that. When you see love in Scripture, you're always seeking the best for the person as it relates to God. Not you and them, but God and them. Because if they're right with God and you're right with God, you're going to be good with each other. And, and your, our, our highest call is where are they at with the Lord? And he appeals to me, he says, Beloved, I want you to get this because he cares. And it's important that we understand this. Notice as well that Peter beseeches or he appeals to them, as I stated, not demands. He's beseeching them. Beseeching is a... Is a it's a step away, if you will, of almost begging. Almost crying out for them to embrace this, to understand, to take hold of what he's saying. I beseech you. I'm appealing to you to get this. Beloved, I, I appeal, I, I beseech you here. He's not demanding this. This isn't just another command that we have. This is Peter telling him, he's appealing to them from a heart that cares 
for them. To do what is right. Basically, by way of example, he's saying as a child of God, how ought we to act? He's appealing to them. He wants them to, to feel that way. Not take it as a command. Now the first aspect, the appeal itself, abstain from fleshly lust. That's what we're told here. And it requires an inner discipline. And this term abstain, we all know what it means, but this is a present middle infinitive, and, it, and the idea is to be holding yourself off from. To be holding oneself off from. Uh, it, it, it marks that a, a constant need is, 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 is necessary. This is a constant uh, ongoing thing you have to do. So it requires of us this inner discipline to abstain. Where does abstinence start? It starts in the heart. You got, we got to say no. It's a discipline of the heart where we are going to say, no, I'm not going here. I'm going to abstain from this. My action is, is I'm not go I don't do it. But the inner discipline is the will to say no in the first place, to hold myself off from it. That's what we're called to do here. So hold ourselves off from it. From what? Fleshly lusts. That's what he says. Look at it. Behold, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Fleshly lusts. Whenever we hear the word lust, we go to the sexual arena immediately. More often than not, that's where we go. And rightly so in our culture because we're, 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 uh, that, that's thrown at us constantly by, by the marketplace, uh, by Hollywood, uh, all over. I mean, you see it everywhere. It, it's thrown at you. Uh, that's the devil's playground. He, he knows the makeup of the man apart from God and how those lusts are, are there, the, the physical uh, desires. But in this particular context, what we have here is it doesn't only speak to the sexual arena. That's not what's here in, in, in its entirety. And that's not Peter's intent uh, when he says the fleshly lust. The idea is that all, all those cravings are, are in view here that are associated with uh, the, the entire nature of a man as a fallen being. So what we're saying is, is the carnal nature, the fleshly man, the desires that, that, that take us down a fleshly path. And that could be anything. I mean, you know, the, it could be covetousness. It could be the sexual arena. It could be uh, any uh, 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 desire for, for power. Any fleshly uh, uh, desire that, that's, that's common to being fallen, to being a fallen man. That's what he's talking about here. Now, with that said, let's add some meat here to the appeal by looking at the two qualifying phrases that help us understand why, as, uh, as, uh, uh, why we're to abstain from, from these things. The first thing he says is, as aliens and strangers. As aliens and strangers. So what, what's he saying? We are to abstain because of what or who we are. That's what he's telling you. I, not, I, I, I truly, I, I, I think we feel this at times, but I also believe the flip side of it is that we're so comfortable with this world that we don't feel like aliens and strangers. There are times we feel very much that way. More, it's, for me, I see it more and more for the whole, the whole believing community. Because I look as a pastor at what's going on in, in the world, and I see what, what our world does, and how what, what we see coming, even being mandated through law, legislatively, uh, is in direct opposition to the very teaching of, of God, the Word of God. So I see that. But my, my thing is, is this idea of being an alien, how real is that to you, personally? I believe for some of you it is. And at moments in time it's very real. But the reality is, is that's who we are. You need to understand that. I need to understand that. I need to understand that. And because of that, being an alien, 
being an alien and a stranger, then it, it should affect how I embrace this world, the, the, the desires of the world, the flesh that operates under this world system. So his point is, is we're to abstain because of what we are. This alien idea denotes people living in a foreign country. You're living in a foreign country where you do not have the rights of citizenship. And I'm going to tell you something. You start speaking for the Lord in this world, and you realize you don't have the rights of citizenship. Because your citizenship really isn't here. And it becomes very real when you start trying to bring God's mandates for citizenship with Him in the kingdom to bear in this world. You're not accepted. It doesn't fit. And it, and it, and it speaks of who we are. We're aliens. We're strangers. We have a citizenship that's in heaven. He says we're strangers. And the stranger idea, you, we know what strangers are. I mean, we, we've seen strangers come into our community or maybe to your house and you've, you've even told your, your, your children, uh, you know, don't, don't talk to strangers, you know, and those kind of things. We understand it. But strangers speaks in, in the culture, it speaks of pilgrims or temporary residency. Uh, you're, you're a stranger there. You're there, but you're not there. You're, 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 you're strange to the environment, to the context, the place. And so, so we're to act like it. And that, that's, that's Peter's point here. We're to act as who we are. Now the second, the second part here, the phrase that he used, he says they wage war against the soul. They wage war against the soul. So look at it again. Beloved, people I love, I care for. I urge you, because of who you are, aliens and strangers, to abstain from fleshly lust. Exercise the discipline, the inner discipline that's called for, and abstain, why? Because they wage war against the soul. They wage war against the soul. The soul being who we are. Who am I? I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a whole part of a holy nation. That's who I am. I have a heavenly citizenship. So they wage war against the soul. I don't know, do, do you feel like you're at war? Because that's how Scripture declares the Christian walk. It's not a peaceful thing. The peace that we have that passeth all understanding is peace with God. It's peace in the midst of the battle. Because I know who holds tomorrow. There's peace in that. But the reality is, is you and I are very much at war. And there's a battle, he tells us, within our soul. The very person of who we are. These fleshly desires, these fleshly lusts, wage war. Now we've talked about that. There's a warfare that goes on between the new man that I am, I'm born again, but I reside in the flesh and because I remain on in a flesh that's subject to the fall and the consequences of the fall and those desires that have been trained over the course of my lifetime and programmed into me by my genetic makeup as a fallen person, I'm fallen. That's who I am. I'm born in sin. Those things have consequence, they have bearing. And because of that, now I'm saved. When I'm saved, I'm new. But I remain on, so there's this conflict. Paul talked about it in Romans 7. You can read about it. There's a war. And I'm telling you, I know all of you have experienced it. Where you, you do the very thing you don't want to do, and you know you're doing it, and there's even remorse about it and, and guilt with it, but we're, we lose battles along the way. We win some, we lose some. But the reality is, is very, the very reality is, is we are at war with the flesh, with this world system. And no more than you can wa would walk out what Peter's telling us, no more than you could walk out of here into a minefield, a known minefield, if you were a true soldier, are we to yield to the fleshly lusts and this world system and the programs of, 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 the, of Satan in this world 
Would we walk out into the devil's minefield, which are fleshly lusts? We can't do that. We have to exercise discipline. We have to abstain from them. You can't keep going there. And I, and I, and I know I'm, I, I'm preaching a message that we get sick of hearing. Because we, we, we stumble and we fall. We stumble and we fall. But God's call upon us is more than just stumbling and falling. He wants us to extol the excellencies of God. And if we're going to do that, then what we have to do is what? He beseeches us to abstain from fleshly lusts. Why? Because they're waging war against your soul. They're at war with your soul. Don't give in to them. So he's calling us to exercise, uh, embrace that appeal, exercise the discipline based upon who we are as aliens and strangers at war with the flesh in this world. Second aspect. The second aspect of this this uh, this uh, passage here, that Peter, this appeal that we need to note if we're going to make it happen in our lives is there is an outward conduct that's needed. Look at verse twelve. He says, "Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles." So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, be, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So there's to be an outward conduct uh, that's needed. There's a, an outward conduct called for. He says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Now having our conduct proper before the world or before the Gentiles, it shifts the focus from the inner spiritual discipline, that battle with the soul, with the soul to the conduct. That's what we see happen in, in the text here. He's talking about our conduct now. This is going on in your soul. It calls for an inner discipline in your life to abstain from those fleshly lusts because you're aliens and strangers. That's who you are in this world. And these are at war with your soul. You're to abstain from it. Now he transitions into the conduct that's called for. What are we to do here? Well, what we see in my mind is it's more than a conduct that we're to, that's called for. It's the fruit. It is conduct. That he's telling us, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. But it's the fruit or the victory of the struggle. The war. If you war, if you're willing to war, what ought to happen is the behavior will reflect an excellency in God. So it's, it's a fruit. It's a fruit. As we fight the war in our mind and spirit, we'll see fruit in our conduct. That's what we're looking for. And the conduct that's called for, and I want you to see this. He says, here, what, what kind of conduct does he call for? Keep your behavior excellent. That's the conduct. He uses excellent as, as, uh, as the conduct, as the, the description. Keep your behavior excellent. That's the description of the conduct that he's calling us to. Now, what's excellent? Well, excellent is is the opposite of, of that which would be lousy or wrong. That which would be against God. We're to extol what about God? The excellencies of God. How do we extol the excellencies of God? Through excellent behavior. We talked about what the excellencies of God are. Who He is, what He's done, what He's doing, His work, His purposes... All of the beauties of God. So what are the excellencies of my behavior? Anything that would reflect the excellencies of the one I call Father. You call Father. That's what we're to live. You know, we say to the, about the world, and I've heard this even about believers, and I, we say it rather arrogantly, by the way, I don't care what they think. Who cares? I don't care what they think. Well, for the believer, wrong. That's wrong. I'm sorry, a believer cannot say, I don't care what they think. Now, you can say it, but you're reflecting 
the fleshly lusts that are war against your soul. Because what we are to do is care very much about what other people think. But especially what they think of the God we say we follow. And the Lord who saved us. That's why we should always care what they think. And by the way, we should care what, we, what other believers think. In every area of our lives. I mean, that's why we get in, in Romans, I'm going to get on a mini message, but even in the areas of Christian liberty in that. They're, they're determined by those, those areas in life what, that God doesn't speak clearly on. What we do or don't do is directly determined by our love for the brethren. For the brothers, the weaker brothers. Doesn't mean you can't engage in them. you you got to care what they think. If they're there, and it could be a danger to them, I should care. But more so as it relates to this passage, to the world. To the world. What do they think? What do they see? Because they use... Because notice what it says here. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers... Now listen. They may be because of your good deeds as they what? Observe them. Don't you kid yourself. They're taking notice of every person who names the name of Christ more so than anybody else. Why, why would they do that? I'll tell you why. Because we extol the excellencies of God. And because we, we do that, they're looking at our behavior so that they can, what? Turn around, turn around and attack our God. See? See? Look at Him. What about Him? What about that person? They're out here doing this and this and this and they say they're believing. Haven't you ever heard that? I've heard that so much it makes me sick. What I tell them is, is that they're at war with the soul. I mean, with, with, they're at war with the fleshly lust that wage war in their soul. They're fighting a battle. If they stay there, we got a real problem. But if they're falling like every other person, it's what they're doing with it. Are they getting up? And confessing it and extolling the virtues of God and His forgiveness and His capacity to love me and to take me from that point and move me forward for Him. That's, you could still have that. But the world, is out. they're watching. They're definitely watching. And they're, attack, they're, they're looking for a point of attack. Right here, this, scene, this text, as it reads here, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers... That indicates that these believers that Peter's talking to are under slanderous attack by the world. They already are. That, that's the indication of, of, the, of the, 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 the text itself. It indicates that they're facing attack. So what were they up against when you look at it here? Well, when you look at this attack that they were under, uh, the believers in the early church, they, they were attacked on, on the basis of many things. But I'll just note some of them. They were attacked, for one, uh, as being disloyal to the state or to Caesar, to Rome. They, 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 they made a case, always making a case for that. Uh, they were also uh, excused, I mean, attacked for upset, upsetting the trade. People getting saved. We see that in, in uh, uh, the, the book of Acts where it upset economies. When people would get saved who were at uh, prosperous businesses that they couldn't function in idols or whatever, they couldn't function in that capacity. They were also uh, accused of uh, treachery uh, or, or teaching, not uh, treachery against the state by teaching slaves that they're free, free in Christ. But not necessarily free, but they made case for that. Hatred of mankind, because you, they, were, they would stay off from the world, separate from the, the practices of the world, wouldn't engage in those things. They were accused of being atheists of all things, because they wouldn't practice idolatry. So they would, uh, called them atheists. They didn't believe in gods. So they were accused of, 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 of being atheists. They were also accused of cannibalism, if you can imagine that, because they taught the communion. 
the flesh and the blood of Christ. They were accused of many things. They were slandered on many fronts. And obviously, we, we, in this context, we know they had to be, be getting slandered because of their conduct. Failings. You know, as natural persons. But the reality is, as I stated, that they can get up or down with that, that failing and receive God's forgiveness and regain the, the ground here. Peter calls us to account on our conduct before the world because we're God's visible representatives, folks. That's, that's who we are, you and I. And if our conduct is excellent, it will accomplish a great purpose, and it's twofold. Look at it. Twofold purpose. The first is it shuts the mouths or silences the evildoers. It silences them. The implication of the passage is is that the slander was going on, but if, you're, if your conduct is excellent, what are they going to say? I mean, they, they have no case. That's the point. They, they can't make a case against you that's valid if your conduct is excellent. If you're doing the right thing, they can't accuse you. And you know, I've seen it in, in, in prison visitation over the years and going and seeing uh, various people, it's interesting that the people in there are all uh, it's somebody else's fault. <laughs> and I, you know, and my question is, is well, did you do, did you do, you know, did you do that? Well, yeah, but but it's corrupt government that lands them there. No, if you hadn't been doing it, they can't make a case against you, and that's the point of it. They can't indict you on something that you're not necessarily doing. There has to be grounds to bring the charge even against you. And so if we keep our behavior excellent, it shuts their mouths. They can't slander us in, in, in that which we're not in, involved in. So we have to uh, practice that excellent behavior. Second, they will glorify God in the day of visitation. That's what he says. Look at it. They may, because of your good deeds, as you live your life, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. This, this is interesting because you can interpret this a couple of ways. One way you can take this, uh, the they'll, they'll glor, they'll glorifying God, that they'll, they'll will glorify God in the day of visitation, is they will be forced to recognize God's hand or God in your life, in the life of the person at the judgment. And, and that ultimately glorifies God. Uh, an example of that, ladies ought to know that from the, their study in Revelation. The church is the church of Philadelphia. That was one of the promises God made to that little church in Philadelphia for their positive stand for God. Though they had little power. They stood, they stood strong in the Lord, and he said the day will come when they will be forced to re recognize. They'll recognize that, that, that God's hand was on them, and that was one of the rewards. So th that's one way of looking at this, is that they will be forced uh, to recognize God's hand in the believer's life at the judgment and thereby glorify God. Second way you can take this is they will glorify, or excuse me, they will see God's hand in you and come to Christ for salvation themselves. That when God does knock on the door of their heart through the, the Holy Spirit, uh, they, they may respond because of your behavior. I believe both of these are, 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 are very possible uh, interpretations, if not uh, both of them being intended here. Uh, that They will be silenced and in, in turn, they glor there, there's a glorifying of God. They have to acknowledge and that they may be brought to Christ by your behavior. One of the greatest, if not the greatest witnesses that we have is a consistent life lived for, for the Lord. Do you know that? It's not, it's not your bold testimony. You may go out of here and meet people Strangers who don't know you. They don't know you. And you go up door-to-door -door visitation, let's say. 
And the Holy Spirit of God may be so at work in that person through whatever circumstances that you just happen to be in the right place by the Lord's sovereign guiding, but the right place at the right time where there's a harvest to be brought. Okay? You may have that. And you may even give them the gospel, share the gospel. They'll give you the opportunity because God's at work there. And you may lead them to Christ. But if you're living in this community before people, and you're living two different ways, and you're not extolling the excellencies of God by your behavior before them, you're crazy if you think they want to sit down with you and listen to what you have to say about their need for this God that you say you serve when you look just like them. That's not extolling the excellencies of God. We're to live in such a way that we silence their mouths in their slander. We live above the world as citizens of heaven, as aliens and strangers here. We just don't fit and they know it. And they're watching us. And the day will come somewhere, some way, the day may come where they're forced to acknowledge that this God you follow has definitely done something in your life that's distinct from those who live in the world and of the world. And that glorifies God. That glorifies God. How much more so in a hostile environment where you're hated and you live this way? That's what we're called to do here. So that we may bring glory to the Lord. But the beauty of this too, folks, when you, when you consider what's here, it's for our good as well. It, it works, it, comes, it doesn't only glorify God, it comes back to us. We abstain and behave, as we abstain and behave properly, what happens is it keeps us on track. It keeps us going as well. I, I came across a, 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 a little illustration from the Reader's Digest years ago saved it, and, and it tells a tale, uh, uh, this uh, lady, uh, Ellie Wessel, Weissel, told the, this tale, it's an old tale, but it, it goes like this, there was a just man in, uh, who lived in Sodom, and he was hoping to save the city of Sodom, and so what he did is, he would pick it, he, w- he would go out on the streets, and, and that, you know, what else could he do? He'd go from street to street. He'd go to the marketplace, and he would shout, and he would uh, verbally uh, talk to people and tell them that they needed to repent. What they're doing is wrong. It'll only kill you. It'll bring destruction to your lives and to, our, to, to the city. And they'd laugh at him, but he'd go on shouting until one day somebody asked him, why in the world... Do you continue to do this? Can't you see that it's useless? And he said, I, I do. And he, he asked him, he said, then why do you keep going? Why do you keep doing this? And listen to what the, how the tale ends. This is what he said. He said, I was convinced that I would change them. Now I go on shouting because I don't want them to change me. We are who we are and we need to embrace that. Because they're out to change us. This world is out to change you. And that's not God's call upon our lives. God's call upon us is that we live in such a way that we extol the excellencies of God ultimately. And the beauty of it is is that we have within our ability as we live for the Lord, And let what's happened to us in our salvation, what He's done for us, let that come to the surface and be the fruit in our lives. And as we uh, live out our lives this way, we, we silence the godless and praise God, we glorify Him. He gets the glory. And I'm going to tell you, that's what it should be all about for us, is to try and shine the light on the Lord. So that when people look at us and how we're living, they see Jesus. And maybe, maybe see their need for Him. That's our prayer. And might come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Let's pray together.
Our Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. We thank you always for your truth and the, 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 the Spirit, the way your Holy Spirit can apply what we, what we see in these ancient words to the immediate day in which we're, we're living, this moment in time. And I pray, Lord, that by your Spirit, the, the truth conveyed this day would become the reality of every believer here, the beloved who make up Prairie Bible Church, that we would exercise the inner discipline necessary to abstain and then, Lord, to, to, to reap the fruit of, of a life that, that's lived out, that, that has deeds that silence the godless and glorify our, our God. Glorify you, Lord. That's our heart. Bless each one this day, Lord, for coming under your word. And I pray that the, the time of worship that we've enjoyed together uh, in song and, and uh, prayer and in your truth, Lord, that it's been edifying and that it will be used of you just to make us the, the, the best possible servants that we can be for you, Lord, for your purposes in this moment. Bless our club ministries this evening, Lord. Uh, we thank you for uh, the ministries there with our young people. And I do pray that we would have an impact in their lives, uh, Lord, that we would be used of you to, to help ground them upon the, the foundation of the Word of God. But just bless the day, Lord. Bless this week ahead of us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.